we don't have to go to space to continue to explore. And I think that in itself is very cool and provides a bit of excitement, but also motivation for young people to get into exploration, to get into science, um, thinking that not everything has been done. There are still things that we can do and things that we can explore and things that we can discover. That was a good time. <laughs> that was a good time. Loads of corals, a lot of fish. It was awesome. By going down to this seamount and documenting what is there and what we find, you know, we're showing the world a unique place and a unique part of their planet that they've not seen before, which in itself is exciting. But I think really what we can get out of it that may have more of a direct impact would be things like conservation of the environment. You don't protect things you don't know. You don't protect a place if you don't know what's there and you don't know what lives there. And there are other things like pharmaceutical products, for example, a lot of drugs or or cosmetics come from things like algae and sponges that live in the ocean. And we don't know where to find those things unless we have thoroughly explored the marine environment. It can get quite depressing to be working in an environment and literally watching it die in front of you. And I think that as a group, coral reef scientists are struggling to come to terms with that where we're all sort of lamenting to each other and going through this sort of mourning cycle of this environment that we love so much. But I think the way that I get through it is I'm trying to find glimmers of hope. I'm trying to find how will these organisms adapt? Is there a way that they're actually gonna be able to survive it? Is there a place where they're actually gonna be able to survive it? Can we find that place? Can we help them get to that place? Is there something that I can actually do that can affect the survival of this ecosystem? And I think that's really, for me, the only way that I could get through watching what's happened happen. Because if you focus on the negative, then it would be really hard to get up every day and keep doing this. The first few days of this expedition I would describe as an emotional roller coaster. And I don't think that people's hopes really turned around until we started actually getting in the water at 12 Mile. So at that point, I think was the turning point of the, the trip when everybody got excited again about what we were doing and why we were there. What was interesting about some of these dives is being a bank uh, in the middle of the Caribbean, you get this compression of upwelling as the water moves across the bank and it drives a lot of productivity right there at the break point on the edge of, of the banks. And so that's where we focused all of our effort. It was remarkable to see the amount of coral structure and really the sponge biodiversity um, was something I had not anticipated. There's only so much you can see when you swim on a coral reef or on this particular seamount. And many species are very small. But the environmental DNA, which is a DNA that they shed in the water in the form of mucus, feces, any kind of body fluid, can be collected and isolated, sequenced, and we can identify the signature using this technique. It's really to get a first idea of what is living on the seamounts. We're sending sound down, it's coming back up. Uh, we're capturing that and that's allowing us to see, similar to the way a bat uses echo sounder. It feels almost like you're an early explorer seeing something for the first time. It's just filling in the map and you get to see it actively scroll across the screen. And that's what's super exciting for our team to sit down with Gretchen's team and pick sites with her based on our bathymetric maps. That's the first place we're going to right there. But what we did was we gave them informed bathymetry that we had collected and then from that, they went and dove those sites and those were the best sites that they dove the entire trip. And for them to be excited and for them to say, oh, we saw this. It was seeing their level of excitement based on something that we could provide for them was, was very exciting for us as well. So I would love to tell you that it's not unique at all for a woman in this day and age to be leading uh, a major exploration expedition. But the reality is it's still actually quite rare. You know, there are only a handful of us that are doing science at these kinds of depths, and I could probably name them all for you on both hands. So to be able to lead an expedition like this as a female in the field, I think is really great for women, and I hope is one of those things that's breaking the glass ceiling. It's been highs and lows for sure. We didn't make it to Pickle, which I know everyone was really gutted about, and there were a couple days when we were all pretty bummed. But I think we have turned it around. I'm really proud of you guys for staying positive and also 
getting this amazing data. We got so much data, including a map of the entire seamount, which is something that I know the government will be really excited about. And also it's very helpful for updating our nautical charts and as well as updating any marine spatial planning efforts. One thing we found was that even though there's continuous habitat on the south side, so a lot of corals and then a big flat of sand and then another outcropping of coral and then a big flat of sand, we actually found more fish on that north side than we did on the south side. So it seems like they're aggregating on these outcroppings of reef on the north. And that may have something to do with the oceanographic conditions. So there's a much stronger current on the north side compared to the south side. And so that might be driving the food chain, which is leading to more fish and bigger fish on the north compared to the south. It's also possible that maybe the south is more heavily fished than the north. And so that's why there are fewer fish there. But all of that, we have to wait to see. We have to do a full scale analysis of all of our surveys and the photogrammetry as well as the eDNA. And that will then give us a bigger picture view of what we found. In terms of trying to get to Pickle Bank, we're looking at sometime between May and July of 2024. Well done, team. Cheers. Cheers to an Cheers. awesome week. I think scientists have struggled for the last two decades to really communicate the crisis that is currently taking place on the planet. And although we as scientists understand it very clearly, being able to communicate that to the general public is something that we as a community have struggled with. I think that the approach now is trying to show people through imagery why we need to protect our planet and how climate change is going to change what we are used to and what we have been accustomed to for our entire lives. Because it's a complicated matter and we use a lot of rhetoric and terminology that isn't standard for the public. And so getting that into a version that is you know, palatable to the average person, I think, is what we're really trying to do now so that it's not so abstract and scary. I think humankind has good intentions. I think they would like to do the right thing to help the ocean and to help the planet, but people like myself and other scientists need to guide them and help them know how to protect the planet. Coral reefs represent this canary in a coal mine situation with how humans are impacting the planet that we live on. And as we watch global warming impact the survival of this entire ecosystem, I think it is really an example to the world and to all of us that we're not doing a good enough job and that we need to be better stewards of the environment for our children and our grandchildren.